Uh, welcome to Westminster Open Lens, the reboot at the start of the parliamentary session. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Stephen Kinnock um, to deliver a short lecture on Britain, a great but divided country. Uh, Stephen is launching a book which he has co-edited and partly written on the spirit of Britain, looking at issues around uh, division. And we've been looking at that in homelessness, immigration, notes on hatred, and a variety of other things. So Stephen, we look forward very warmly uh, to your uh, comments and your insights as to where Britain finds itself today and what might be done about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Neil. And, and thanks so much to Reboot for the opportunity to come and talk a bit today about some of the huge issues and challenges that the, the country faces. Um, we're really focusing in the book that you mentioned, uh, Spirit of Britain, Purpose of Labour, uh, on how divided the country is. And uh, we say that because of the polarisation that we're facing, we're also paralysed. Uh, the huge gap that we have between uh, values and interests uh, means that it's extremely difficult to find common ground. And when you are unable to find common ground, you often end up with a system that goes into limbo uh, and the risk of it going from limbo into a complete meltdown is quite great. So uh, what comes from polarization is paralysis. And what we're trying to do with the book is set out how the Labour Party can actually be a party that can reunite the de our deeply divided country and get us out of the stalemate that we currently find ourselves in. Clearly, with the incredibly divided and weak Tory government that we had, have, the, the party should be at least 20 points ahead in the opinion polls. Um, but we still can't pull ahead. We've had eight years of Tory austerity, many, many years of the Tory psychodrama over Europe, uh, and the, a government that is weaker and more divided than any we've had in living memory. Why are we therefore no closer to having that domination in the opinion polls and the move into clearly being a party of government? Uh, and I think the answer does lie in the fact that, the, that our country is so divided. Uh, and it lies in the fact that we're at real risk of being part of the problem, not part of the solution. Um, we know that the divisions that our country uh, is dealing with were not created by the EU referendum, but the referendum threw a very sharp searchlight uh, uh, onto those divisions, and that, I think, has deepened and entrenched them. And the 2017 general election actually uh, consolidated and further entrenched those divisions. Those divisions, I think, are you can broadly um, describe them as young versus old, city versus town, graduate versus non-graduate. And in the book, uh, we call these two tribes what we call a cosmopolitan tribe and a communitarian tribe. The cosmopolitan tribe, broadly speaking, voted remain, and the communitarians voted leave. Let's think a bit about those communitarian voters because the central argument in our book is those are the, those are the voters that Labour has lost touch with. We are increasingly becoming a party of the cosmopolitans and we're losing touch with those communitarian voters. Uh, and th those voters have seen, and those people, those communities, uh, have seen uh, a decades of... Uh, the failure of politics to um, listen to their values and to their interests uh, and also to put policies in place that can actually stop the rot. Because for decades those uh, constituencies and those communities have seen the uh, destruction of their industries, uh, destruction of the manufacturing base and destruction of what goes with that which is their sense of identity and place uh, and where they are in the UK. And they're typically uh, families and communities 
that have bitter experience of what we'd call the whirlwind of globalization that has ripped through their communities and their high streets. They're people who've lost a sense of control over their own destiny. And people who are less likely to have the skills and the connections and the networks that you need to get on in the churn of the 21st century uh, uh, labor market. Obviously, there's nothing new in any of this. I'm the MP for Aberavon in, in South Wales. Um, we know better than others because we've got the largest steelworks in the country in Port Albert, the importance of the trade in industrial goods with the European Union. But Aberavon voted 60-40 for leave. So you might wonder why, and when it's so clearly vital to our, to our economy to have frictionless trade with the European Union. Well, I'll tell you why. I think the, the manufacturing decline that we've seen for decades and the rupturing of the identity and community that goes with that, um, the feeling that when people from towns and communities uh, like the one I represent spoke out, they were ignored by mainstream politicians who seem to be intent only on promoting cosmopolitan values and interests. Uh, when they said, what is happening here, they were told, well, globalization is an unstoppable force of nature. Let's not forget, you know, in 2005, uh, in an era-defining speech for the Labour Party and for our country, Tony Blair, of course, said, we, we, can, we can see globalization as inevitable, the forces of globalization inevitable. It's, like, it's just like autumn follows summer. Now, the problem is that that sent a message, I think, which was to say there's nothing that government can do about the unstoppable forces of the root, rootless uh, multinational corporations. There's nothing that we can do to protect and build uh, a new economic model We've just got to let globalization rip through the country uh, and we're just going to take it on the chin and hopefully make the best of it. Uh, and the other thing that I think has raised a lot of frustration was every time they raised concerns about the impact of immigration on the, their communities, they were told by mainstream politicians that they were either bigots or racists. Uh, and, and, you know, let's be clear, these are proud, resilient people. They're not looking for special treatment. They're not looking for anybody's charity. What they are looking for is a level playing field uh, and an opportunity to compete without one hand tied behind their back. But they've watched helplessly as investment and talent and resources were sucked into London and the Southeast, uh, out of the industrial heartlands of Wales and the Midlands and the North. Uh, uh, into London and the South East and out of manufacturing and into financial services. And that, you know, that's, they clearly wondered why governments were standing by and allowing this to happen. New Labour achieved some incredibly important things, changed the face of our country, record levels of spending on health and education, uh, huge uh, assistance through working families uh, tax credits, lifting millions of children out of poverty. I'm the first to recognize that. But whilst the introduction of the minimum wage was a vitally important reform, it needed to be accompanied with an industrial strategy that kept our manufacturing base uh, where it was um, in the 1970s and 1980s. If you look at the German experience, uh, in the 1970s, their manufacturing was 25% of their uh, GDP, it's still at around 25%. Our manufacturing has dropped from 30% in the 1970s to less than 10% now. And I think from that you can trace directly the massive shift in the UK's economic model, uh, which has caused uh, so many of the issues uh, that we'd, we discuss in the book. Obviously, the, the Tories don't have any answers to these questions. Uh, they, uh, under them, we, we see only social mobility dropping off. We see austerity, privatization, uh, and contracting out having a massive impact on our, our, our public services. But I think that this shift in the UK's economic model explains much of the underlying causes 
of Brexit. There were many of the 52% who voted Leave, they did so because it was a communitarian backlash. It was the impact on their economy, on their jobs, on their families, on their sense of community and their sense of identity. People thought, you know, what if David Cameron is telling me to vote Remain in order to protect the recovery. Well, whose recovery is that? People who had seen only their wages stagnate and, and be frozen since 2007, the, the longest period since the Industrial Revolution. Why should you vote for the status quo when all the status quo has done has made my family poorer and caused my community to lose its sense of identity and purpose? What does all this mean for the party? Well, I think it is vital that Labour sees the divisions and understands our role in bringing the country back together. And if you accept the thesis that there's a, there are two tribes in the country, country, the cosmopolitans and the communitarians, and that the communitarians are predominantly those who drove the Leave vote, and that they are increasingly voting for the Tories. And, and yet, uh, those should be our people. Those are our, in our heartlands. It's, it's fantastic to win in Kensington and Canterbury, but if you're also losing in places like Mansfield and Middlesbrough and North East Derbyshire, well, uh, you're not only seeing uh, the divisions that our country is facing, but you also start to ask questions about where Labour fits into that. Are we just going to be a party of the cosmopolitans, of the urban, younger graduate class, or are we still going to stand up for those people who don't live in the big cities, who don't have a university degree, uh, and who do need uh, the Labour Party is their only chance in terms of having the skills and the wherewithal that they need to build in order to prosper in the 21st century. Our principles are of unity and cohesion and collective endeavour. So we need to be deeply concerned by this state of, of affairs. Um, two really important statistics uh, that I think we should bear in mind. In 2010, we won 29% of the popular vote, which delivered 258 seats. In 2017, we won 40% of the vote, which is a huge increase in the popular vote, but it delivered just four more seats. We, we went to 262. So we're clearly piling up votes in uh, certain areas, but those that we're not broadening our appeal and reaching out and winning in the way that you have to win uh, under the first-past-the-post system. There was a swing against Labour in 130 constituencies, the vast majority of which contained high numbers of communitarians and people who also voted Leave. So, you know, our party fought a brilliant uh, campaign and much of what was in the manifesto uh, was absolutely chiming with the kind of changes we need to make, radical Keynesian economics, and that's absolutely right. And we should, of course, celebrate winning votes from cosmopolitans. We should celebrate winning in Kensington and Canterbury. But can we really afford to turn our backs on our communitarian heartlands? People who are at the sharp end of the job market, people who Labour was founded to serve. It's not just an electoral necessity that we represent communitarians, and let's not forget the vast majority of our target seats now are in communitarian areas. This is about our fundamental purpose as a party. It's a moral duty for us to represent those people. If we become a party that only represents the cosmopolitans and their values and interests, then I think we would no longer be the Labour Party. We have to be a whole nation party that can forge a new settlement between the cosmopolitans and the communitarians and bring our country together. And that's the argument that's at the heart of Spirit of Britain, Purpose of Labour, that only a whole nation Labour Party can reunite our deeply divided country and truly govern for the many. In the book, we then lay out a number of major shifts, uh, we call them seismic shifts, that Labour needs to make to reconnect with our communitarian roots. Uh, we have a team of authors, people like Dan Jarvis, Anna Turley, Emma Reynolds, Steve Reed, Justin Madders, and also people who are not MPs, people like Will Straw and the Labour Lever 
uh, John Mills. So we see the book very much as Labour leavers and Remainers coming together to try to forge uh, a new settlement. And in the book, we set out a plan for the common good uh, around the aspects of life that matter most to the people that we meet on the doorstep in our constituencies uh, week in, week out. Work, family, community, and country. Our thesis is that the Labour Party seems to be stuck between the anti-capitalist, statist, and protectionist, uh, and often conspiracy theory-driven politics of the hard left, and the defeatist, laissez-faire politics of the liberal center, which has seen globalization as a force of nature that can't be managed or harnessed. N neither the politics of the hard left or the politics of the liberal center can reunite the country, and neither can serve the true purpose of labor. We set out in the book uh, how we should unite around mainstream labor values and, uh, and a plan that ensures new technologies and the fourth industrial re revolution serve the many, building public services that are both smart and compassionate, a plan that empowers our communities, really uh, set, sends power out to the communities, and a plan to restore our ability to stand tall in the world with authority, credibility, and integrity. It's a collection of ideas. It's not a collective endorsement of any particular position, and each author in the book is, is writing for themselves. But one thing we do know is that we're crying out, the whole country is crying out, for a project of renewal designed and led by a whole nation Labour Party, powered by radical Keynesian economics, a wholehearted commitment to devolving power, and an unequivocally patriotic worldview. We don't subscribe to the view that everything that's bad in the world is, is managed by some sort of axis of Washington and Tel Aviv. We don't subscribe to the view that NATO is some kind of warmongering war junta. Uh, we believe that, yes, huge mistakes have been made, but our country can and still must be a force for good in the world. We also say it would be a, a real error if we think we can win the next election just by doubling down on the cosmopolitan vote. That's not going to happen. We've dug as deep as we can into the cosmopolitan vote. We must broaden our appeal to communitarians. One more heave strategy simply will not do it. So we want to see the manifesto, the 2017 manifesto, as a, as a, a, a basis for discussion, not as a tablet in stone. We mustn't fight the next election as if it was the last one. So we hope that uh, Jeremy and his team will see the book and take it in the spirit that it was meant. An analysis of why our communitarian heartlands are deserting us, a call to rapidly and decisively reconnect with those communitarian communities, a set of constructive proposals that could help our country to forge a new settlement between the cosmopolitans and the communitarians, and in so doing, uh, reunite and truly govern for the many, not just for one electoral term, because you don't change the country in one term. We need a, an electoral coalition that will reunite the country for at least two terms so that we can deliver the changes that the country so desperately needs. I, the, the book is out on Monday, the 10th of September, and I hope you enjoy reading it. <laughs>